Welcome to Dove Biology, Apes Lessons to Go. This is Unit 2, Earth Systems. What are they and how do they work? So the Earth is kind of like an island system with limited resources. By understanding the interconnected systems of the Earth, we may learn important lessons about sustainability so not to have a global tragedy, not unlike that of what befell the people of Easter Island. One way to better understand the Earth and the relationships between living things is by studying ecology. Ecology is the study of how organisms interact with one another and their non-living environment. To better understand nature, scientists have classified matter into different levels from that of the atom all the way up to the biosphere. And of course, astronomers continue to classify all the way up until the whole of the universe. Now in terms of ecology, we're going to be focusing more on that of the organization from organisms through biosphere. So organisms will uh, group together to form populations of the same species. Then we'll have communities of different species interacting together. And then our ecosystems are going to include the groups of living and non-living components working together. And then the biosphere is all of those living and non-living areas working together. Now the Earth itself contains four basic life support systems, including the atmosphere, the hydrosphere, the geosphere, and the biosphere. The first of those that we'll talk about is the atmosphere. The atmosphere has many layers, but the two layers which are really essential for life are that of the troposphere and the stratosphere. The troposphere is the innermost layer of the atmosphere. Uh, it contains all of our breathable air, and it's only about 11 miles thick. Sitting on top of that, we have the stratosphere. And what's really important for life is the lower portion of that stratosphere, which contains a very important molecule called ozone, which is O3, three oxygens together. And the role of ozone is to block out that harmful ultraviolet radiation. Now, the Earth is a water planet, and the hydrosphere is what contains all of the Earth's water, both its liquid, ice, and vapor forms. Without this uh, presence of water and the presence of water in all three forms, life is unlikely to exist. Next, we have our geosphere. The geosphere contains the inner core, our mantle, and then what's called the lithosphere. And the lithosphere is both the crust and the uppermost part of the mantle. Now, the crust is essential for life because it contains both the, the non-renewable fuels and minerals that we use in the products that we consume, but also it contains the soil nutrients, which support the plants, which then support all other terrestrial life. Finally, we have the biosphere. And the biosphere is the parts of the atmosphere, the hydrosphere, and the geosphere where we're actually finding living things. Now, if we were to think of the Earth as an apple, then that biosphere would just be the skin. So all in all, the goal of ecology is going to be able to understand the interactions of this thin life supporting global skin. Now the life that exists in the biosphere depends on three important factors. Number one, we have the one-way flow of energy from the sun. The sun's energy supports the photosynthetic processes, which allows for life to have metabolism and that flow of energy through themselves. That energy of the sun also is responsible for establishing climate and uh, assisting with the cycling of matter on planet Earth. Speaking of which, the cycling of matter is really essential. It's one of those three factors. Matter cannot be created or destroyed. All of the matter that exists on Earth was here when it was formed, and that's all that we have to work with since the Earth is essentially a closed system for matter. So matter needs to cycle, and so we need the sun to assist with that, as well as a lot of other organisms which are going to help with recycling that matter. 
a big component of that is going to be gravity. Without gravity, things might, like uh, the gases that are in our atmosphere, would just escape off into space. So gravity assists with the cycling of matter and makes sure that those essential things that are necessary for life stays here on the planet. Now, scientists have classified the places where living things can be found um, into two areas, depending upon where they are. The land part of the biosphere is called biomes, and the water parts of the biosphere are going to be called aquatic life zones. They're classified into the different biomes and life zones based upon the living and non-living characteristics. So, for example, a desert biome is classified because of the low precipitation uh, to evaporation ratio and the vegetation that you're going to find there, as opposed to, say, for example, a deciduous forest, which is going to have moderate seasonal rains um, dominated by forest, which are able to lose their leaves um, depending upon the seasons. Now, each biome and aquatic life zone consists of a patchwork of different ecosystems. And an ecosystem is going to be all of those living and non-living things in a certain area and how they interact. The living components we refer to as those that are biotic. So, for example, in our picture here, we have a lot of biotic things. We've got a turtle, we've got some fish, we've got some bacteria, we've got our little bug here. And of course, we've got some plants. Those are biotic. Bio is a prefix which means life. The non-living things are referred to as the abiotic factors. Remember, when you put an A or an in front of something, it often makes it as a not. So abiotic, not alive. So the sun, the air, the water, these are all non-living components. And so the living and non-living things that are interacting together is what's making up that ecosystem. Now, natural ecosystems, you know, oftentimes, you know, we establish them as uh, separate and independent units, but they really don't have any distinct boundaries. In fact, one ecosystem is simply going to merge with another. So a land ecosystem and a aquatic ecosystem will have sort of this transitional zone. This transitional zone is going to be called an ecotone. Now, these ecotones actually are kind of a unique uh, area of life and non-life um, apart from the separate ecosystems that it connects. Um, it's going to have almost like a blend of those organisms as we're transitioning from one area to another. So uh, in this particular uh, transitional zone, we see some organisms that are going to need the moisture of the aquatic zone and some areas uh, that also are going to require some land. So for example, an amphibian is a great example of an organism that will really be found mostly in that transitional zone because they rely on the water for reproduction, but they also rely on the land for food and survival as an adult. Each population in an ecosystem has a range of tolerance to variations in its physical and chemical environment. Organisms require a specific temperature, a specific pH, or perhaps even specific nutrients to be able to survive optimally in that particular ecosystem. For example, let's take a look at these fish and the physical characteristic of temperature. These fish have an optimum temperature which allows them to survive best. As we get too cold or too hot, the fish will begin to first feel some stress and then eventually not be able to live in that area. The existence, abundance, and distribution of a species is based upon whether or not the levels or chemical factors fall within their range of tolerance. This is known as the law of tolerance. So, for example, the sugar maple is able to live only within a specific range because that range is able to meet um, their range of tolerance. As we get beyond that particular area, they're not going to be able to survive. Highly tolerant species can live in a variety of habitats with the different conditions. So the sugar maple is not quite as tolerant as another species that could be widespread across the whole of the United States. Now while there is a variety of factors that can affect the number of organisms in a population,
Sometimes one factor is more important than another in regulating that population, and we call that the limiting factor. In fact, the limiting factor principle says that too much or too little of any abiotic factor can actually limit or prevent the growth of a population, even if all other factors are near the optimal range. Now what's kind of interesting is that limiting factors can kind of change depending upon maybe even the age um, or life stage of a given species. For example, uh, in a population of say, for instance, these corn plants, in the early stages of their life, one of the most important limiting factors is lack of moisture. So they may have all other characteristics of their environment are optimal. If they didn't have enough um, moisture, then that would hold them back from reaching their maximum possible production. Whereas if they got older, uh, the mature plants are more at risk from insects and disease, and that would limit their maximum potential. So throughout their lives, those limiting factors may change. So if we're going to study ecology, how would an ecologist learn about an ecosystem? Well, sometimes an ecologist will actually go into the ecosystem and study the organisms and the environment directly. Sometimes, though, they're not able to do that. So we need to use other uh, mechanisms. For example, we can use remote sensors like cameras, onboard aircraft, or even satellites to collect data and analyze huge areas of uh, information all at once. We even can create uh, self-contained environments in our own laboratories so that we can study ecosystems in a kind of controlled environment. The more that we're able to understand ecology, both those living and non-living things in an environment and how they work together, we can make sure that we can uh, follow the principles of sustainability, uh, seek out new ways to live within our environment so that we avoid tragedies such that of Easter Island.